A reading from the Book of Wisdom. Wisdom I loved and sought after from my youth. I sought to take her for my bride and was enamored of her beauty. She adds to nobility the splendor of companionship with God. Even the Lord of all loved her. For she is instructress in the understanding of God, the selector of his works. And if riches be a desirable possession in life, what is more rich than wisdom, who produces all things? And if prudence renders service, who in the world is a better craftsman than she? Or if one loves justice, the fruits of her works are virtues. For she teaches moderation and prudence, justice and fortitude. And nothing in life is more useful for men than these. Within my dwelling, I should take my repose beside her. For association with her involves no bitterness, and living with her no grief, but rather joy and gladness. Thinking thus within myself, and reflecting in my heart, that there is immortality in kinship with wisdom, and good pleasure in her friendship, and unfailing riches in the works of her hands, and that in frequenting her society there is prudence, and fair renown in sharing her discourses, I went about seeking to take her for my own. The word of the Lord.
Gospobisko. Lexio Sancti Evangelii secondo Matteo. Jesus said to his disciples, You are the salt of the earth, but what if salt goes flat? How can you restore its flavor? Then it is good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Men do not light a lamp and then put it under a bushel basket. They set it on a stand where it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, your light must shine before men so that they may see goodness in your acts and give praise to your heavenly Father. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have come not to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Of this much I assure you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter of the law, not the smallest part of a letter, shall be done away with until it all comes true. That is why whoever breaks the least significant of these commandments and teaches others to do so shall be called least in the kingdom of God. Whoever fulfills and teaches these commands shall be great in the kingdom of God. Erbom dovor mini, Today on the Church's universal calendar, St. Bonaventure is celebrated as an obligatory memorial. But of course, within the Franciscan order of our EWTN friars, they celebrate it as a feast because Bonaventure is one of their own fellow Franciscans. And I'm sure that um, Father Anthony is very, very pleased that he has a Father of Mercy priest wearing a Franciscan chasuble. Okay, I'm sure he's thrilled with this, and I am thrilled about it. And it's a beautiful vestment with the Tau cross on the back. Every time I see an image of the Tau cross, I think of the parapet of the temple in Hansville at the Shrine of the Most Blessed Sacrament. No soon had the uh, shrine opened in December of 1999. It's going almost on 25 years now that the shrine's been open to the public. How, how time flies, huh? That uh, lightning struck the concrete cross at the pinnacle of the temple and made it into a Tau cross and they were going to repair it and Mother Angelica said, no, don't repair it. Francis loved the Tau cross. This is a sign from God. Until this day, it's a Tau cross at the very pinnacle of the temple, the shrine of the Most Blessed Sacrament, overlooking the piazza where the Divino Nino is. Very, very interesting story, that, that Tau cross. And then of course, the top part that got taken off through the lightning is on display in the St. Joseph Courtyard, just across from the receptionist area. So we celebrate the Franciscans in a special day, and we remember our Franciscan brothers from EWTN and, and fathers as they head out today uh, to begin their journey to the Eucharistic Congress, now in the midst of the three-year Eucharistic revival, taking place this week, uh, Wednesday the 17th through Sunday the 21st proper, the five-day Congress, expecting some 80 thousand people into Indianapolis, and our friars are going to uh, there to celebrate that, and of course we'll be getting uh, footage for Life on the Rock and other programs, and a large portion of the EWTN crew is going there too, the camera crews, interviewing crews, so we keep all of them in our prayers and everybody attending the Eucharistic Congress, now in year two and a half, huh? almost the third complete year of uh, the three-year Eucharistic revival. So again, Bonaventure is a feast within the Franciscans today, and rightly so, because he's one of their own. Uh, 
Cardinal Bishop and Doctor of the Church. He's one of the church's 37 doctors. 13th century is when he lived, but he still leads a very, very important life in the life of Holy Mother Church, the Bride of Christ. Born around 1221 in the Tuscan region of Italy, Bonaventure entered the Franciscan Friars Minor in 1243. You know, his, his name means uh, good journey, Bonaventura, Bonaventure, you know. The Italians have great names. I mean, they all mean something, you know. It's just fantastic. When you, when you say Bonaventure's name, you want to say it with a big bowl of pasta right in front of you, you know. It just, just sounds great. But we, we wish the EWTN crew and all the Franciscan Friars and everyone a good journey, a Bonaventura, right? to Indianapolis. Bonaventure was elected Minister General in 1257 and solidified the Order of Friars Minor in a time of the community's expansion. It was greatly growing at this time. At that particular time, the Franciscans' explosive growth, unfortunately, at the same time, threatened the purity of the apostolate in serving the poor, right? And so Bonaventure was instrumental in making sure that this expansive, explosive growth of the Franciscan order uh, stayed true to the apostolate as to why Francis founded them. Having been schooled at the University of Paris where he rose to the position of master, Bonaventure brought a keen intellectual mind to his task. He wrote the definitive biography of St. Francis of Assisi as well as a commentary on the entire Franciscan rule. And he defended the evangelical councils and their perfection from its critics, the three evangelical councils or, or vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. He defended the three evangelical councils. He's considered the second founder of the Franciscan order, right after Francis of Assisi. So Bonaventure's big stuff. And we still celebrate him even today. Again, great intellectual mind, great lover of the church, great lover of his order. And he gives us a lot of, uh, a, a lot of points on how to live life individually, each one of us, as a good journey. As a good journey. You know, many of you remember Fern and Hoyt Hale. Up until about two and a half or three years ago, they attended daily mass and they sat in this front pew. Well, Fern passed away this past week at age 93. She was gonna be 94 this coming October 15th, I believe. She died at age 93, and yesterday was her funeral, and all of the Franciscan priests were there, and I was able to come celebrate with them. And you know, her and Hoyt, she and Hoyt celebrated their 70th wedding anniversary just this past May 5th, a couple of months ago. And during the gathering there at the funeral home, because the mass was held in the large chapel of the funeral home, they had the montage of all the photographs while the family were greeting all the attendees who came to pay their respects to Fern's life. And this beautiful montage on, of photographs on the monitor there, the large screen monitor, showed so many photographs of the large extended family, of just the immediate extended family, which is just around 40 people. And one of the things that the Hale family did uh, annually was go to Florida to the beach for the 4th of July, you know, extended family-wise. And this year, 30 of them were able to go. And that was just a week and a half ago. And Fern and Hoyt went to that. <laughs> So, which they did every year. And I thought, what a beautiful, well-lived life journey, Bonaventura, right, that Fern lived. And watching the montage, so many of the photographs were of the large extended family, just the immediate extended family, like I said. And in all those photographs with the 30, 40 people, I kept thinking one thing, that whole group of people right there started because only two people said yes to one another and for one another before the Blessed Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, 70 years ago. I'm witnessing these large groups of family gatherings of this large extended family only because 70 years ago, 
Two people said yes to one another and for one another before the triune Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, during the celebration of their sacrament of matrimony. God rest, fern soul. What a, a beautiful, beautiful, well-lived life. Bonaventura, right? good journey, a good journey of a life. Bonaventure, we've already said, loved the three evangel evangelical councils of poverty, ch chastity, and obedience. He lived also humility and a single-minded devotion to Christ as a learned teacher, and he was named eventually the Cardinal Bishop of Albano, Italy. A story is told, I love this. Many of you know that one of my favorite areas of study within theology is the theology of faithfulness to daily duty. I've preached on it a lot. Do what you're supposed to do, when you're supposed to do it, in the way it's supposed to be done. The virtue of diligence, the virtue of industriousness, right? Uh, whether single, married, widowed, active religious, contemplative religious, active nun teaching in the classroom, cloistered nun in the monastery, like the nuns, the poor Claire nuns in Hansville, it doesn't matter. The virtues of diligence, industriousness, in regards to faithfulness to daily duty. Becoming holy right where you are. Your sanctification begins right where you are, okay? I love this story about Bonaventure. A story is told of the day that the papal legates from Rome arrived at the Franciscan house in Florence to hand deliver to Bonaventure the red cardinal's hat, as he had been named the cardinal bishop of Albano. Bonaventure was inside the monastery at that moment, washing dishes in the kitchen. In obedience to the Franciscan rule, he first finished the dishes before receiving his papal visitors. The dishes got to be done first. I don't care if they're from Rome. <laughs> you know, faithfulness to the rule, faithfulness to daily duty, that's holiness in the making right there. You know, when you think of Fern as a wife, a mother, a grandmother, a great-grandmother, you know, so again, a good life journey, huh? Bonaventure died in 1274, the same year as St. Thomas Aquinas, whom he knew well. And there's a beautiful mosaic at the Sister Servants Chapel just up the road here, the Sister Servants who own and operate Casa Maria, where many retreats take place on weekends. That's their primary apostolate, is having retreat masters come in and, and preach weekend retreats. In their chapel, there's a beautiful... Uh, mosaic of tiles. I believe they're Portuguese made. The Portuguese are known for their tile making, and it's a beautiful uh, rectangular, vertical rectangular uh, mosaic tile of Bonaventure and Thomas Aquinas embracing. They knew each other well. Thomas also died in 1274. They both died the same year. Uh, Bonaventure died during the Second Council of Lyon while it was taking place. Thomas Aquinas, if I remember correctly, died on his journey back home from the Second Council of Lyon. That must have been one heck of a council, huh? Okay, and two people died. But uh, two great saints, right? But uh, they knew each other well, and they embraced each other well. Again, Bonaventure died in 1274 and was named a doctor of the church in 1588, some 300 years later. He is known specifically as the seraphic doctor, as he taught that the very goal of all the arts and sciences is the direct contemplation of Almighty God, which brings us back to faithfulness to daily duty. Everything we do should lead us ultimately to a state of contemplation of Almighty God and his greatness and his goodness toward us. The title of Seraph Seraph Seraphic Doctor is also a reference to St. Francis' mystical vision of the crucified Christ in the form of a seraph, angel. And of course, remember that Bonaventure wrote the definitive biography of St. Francis of Assisi as one had not yet been done. This is why, again, he's considered, Bonaventure is, the second founder of the Franciscan order. Of St. Bonaventure, Pope Benedict XVI said, the whole of his thinking was profoundly Christocentric. Christ-centered is what Christocentric means. The whole of his thinking, the whole of Bonaventure's thinking, Pope Benedict XVI tells us, was profoundly Christocentric. 
His extensive writings did much to illuminate the study of both philosophy and theology, and he is regarded as, again, the second founder of the Franciscan order. He lived, no doubt, the virtue of industriousness, the virtue of diligence as well, and I want to close by talking a little bit about these. The virtue of industriousness is defined as commitment and faithfulness to tasks and duties, especially in work that leads to natural and supernatural maturity, whether it's physical work, physical labor, or intellectual work, intellectual labor. It leads one to the fullness of their personal human maturity. Is my maturity where it should be? And I don't mean just intellectual maturity. I mean the passions, the emotions, the intellect, the will. Am I where I should be in my Christian maturity, the living of my life, how I live my life? Having the virtue of industriousness means that you are diligent and hardworking, true enough, but again, especially in a way that leads to your personal maturity. When we are young, for example, being industrious can look like such things as completing homework on time, doing chores without being asked by your parents, taking care of pets, etc. Just on your own, knowing that these things need to be done, and you do them, and you do, you do them well. Again, the theology of faithfulness to daily duty, right? Do what you're supposed to do, when you're supposed to do it, in the way it's supposed to be done. One woman approached me one night after a parish mission when I had talked about this very topic. She says, Father Wade, I love St. Therese of Lisieux, and you're basically talking about her little way, the little way of St. Therese, faithfulness to daily duty. Okay, great, wonderful. Maybe that's why she's a doctor of the church. Little flower, show us your power, right? St. Therese, little flower, show us your power. Now, the virtue of diligence speaks to, to a, the similar virtue of industriousness, but also includes things like persistence, consistency, perseverance, dedication, and tenacity. Diligence may be described as an attitude exhibiting constant and earnest effort to accomplish whatever has to be undertaken regardless of any obstacles or stumbling blocks that might be in the way. So where industriousness has to do to leading you to your personal maturity in Christ in all things spiritual and temporal, your intellect, your will, your passions, your emotions, your feelings, where industriousness leads you to personal maturity, diligence specifically has to do with accomplishing the task at hand regardless of what hindrances, stumbling blocks, or circumstances might make it difficult to finish those tasks or that particular task. Diligence is an attitude which exhibits an earnest effort to continue with the task or that of a certain accomplishment, regardless of the distractions that may surround it. You know, uh, I, I'm of Portuguese heritage. I've already mentioned the Portuguese tiles of Bonaventure and Thomas Aquinas embracing. And I remember my father, God rest his soul, Louis Menezes, he died in 2011. I remember him frequently telling us five kids, we're all stair steps in age pretty much, and he would frequently tell us kids, I mean, we, we could be adolescent, pre-adolescent, especially in our teenage years and young adults, he would always tell us, sempre a frente, sempre a frente, always forward, always forward. And working on this homily about the virtue of, of industriousness and the virtue of diligence, I thought, that's what siempre a frente means, always forward. You know, how, how often have we heard the, the phrase, onward, Christian, soldier? See, you even know it. Onward, always forward, siempre a frente. Okay. See, you know Portuguese now, right? Okay. All right. Siempre a frente. So... All of this, as Bonaventure's life shows us so beautifully, uh, leads us to seek and pursue the true, the good, and the beautiful, which are the foundations of living a virtuous life, which leads to a bona ventura, a good journey of life. And of course, the true, seeking the true has to do with the intellect, Seeking the good has to do with the will. I point to the heart because we always choose something based 
on a perceived good. And so we choose with the will. And we choose with love. Even though it might be a disordered love that leads you into sin, you still ch have chosen something, even if it's an evil, based on that you perceived it as a good. You were wrong in perceiving it as a good, but you still chose it as a perceived good. But we want to pursue the good things, the non-evil things, as a good. So, pursuing the true has to do with the intellect. Pursuing the good has to do with the will. And pursuing the beautiful has to do with the five senses. Because we take things in through sight, smell, taste, touch, and hearing. You know, smell like that big bowl of pasta I mentioned earlier, right? Okay. So all of this, as Bonaventure's life shows us so well, leads us to live a good life. And then we can practice the Beatitudes and the Commandments, which is, are mentioned in today's gospel for St. Bonaventure. And Jesus says very clearly, I did not come to abolish the old law, that is the Ten Commandments. No, I came to bring them to perfection. And he gives us the nine Beatitudes. The nine Beatitudes are the handmaids of the Ten Commandments. Think of the Ten Commandments as the strict letter of the law, and the nine Beatitudes, or eight, depending on what scripture translation you're looking at, or the eight Beatitudes being the spirit of the law. The letter of the law, the Ten Commandments, the spirit of the law, the nine Beatitudes, which were the gospel just before today's gospel. Saint Bonaventure, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.